The first scripture is Colossians 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what we're dealing here with is or we're answering brethren who are saying Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. It's not even that Jesus is God. He was 100% God and 100% man. And my response to that scripture is, Paul does not warn the church against philosophy. He warns against vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. We teach philosophy here. Philosophy is a good thing. It teaches you to think, to think rationally, and it teaches you logic. Philosophy is a good thing. It teaches you how to live life, how to respond to situations in life. So we're going to take it, we're going to dissect and analyze the scripture. We start with Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 1. Vanity. The Greek word translated vanity, Strong's 2, 7, 5, 6, means empty. In other words, ideas that do not emanate from the substance or authority of the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ or have not been validated by the Spirit of Christ. That's what Paul is saying. The word vanity, he's saying avoid vanity, avoid vain deceit. Vanity are vain ideas, are ideas that do not emanate from the substance or authority of the Spirit of Christ, or have not been validated by the Spirit of Christ. Paul then goes on to explain how to identify ideas that do not emanate from the authority of the Spirit of Christ. And this is how you identify them. They're deceitful. Ideas that do not emanate from the authority of the Spirit of Christ are deceitful ideas. Deceit, Strong's 539, means delusion. So I was really glad I did this study because I didn't know that. I didn't know that the delusion that we're told about in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, is talking about deceit. That no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so this, oh, there must be another verse there, because that doesn't say anything about delusion. Verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 and 11. And he's coming with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They receive not the love of the truth. It doesn't even say that they didn't receive the truth. They received not the love of the truth. See, when you love the truth, you have to love truth to be saved, because if you don't love truth, how did I get to, how do we all get to the place that we love truth? I don't know, I think we're just born that way. If you don't love truth, that means, you see, truth is a standard. If you don't love truth, then you're going to believe what's convenient. You're going to believe what, what will result in something that's good for you, or what you think is good for you, rather than the truth. Sometimes when you believe the truth, it's painful. The end result of it is that it's good for you. But sometimes initially hearing the truth is painful about yourself or about other people. So if you don't love the truth, you will never believe things that could cause you pain. And then you will be deluded. Let me say that again because that's really important because I didn't even know that until I just said it to you. Okay. You need to love the truth. If you don't love the truth, you will be inclined to believe things that are convenient for you because the truth is painful. So you will believe the convenient thing the truth that makes life easy for you, and then you're sure to be deceived. So how do you love the truth? Well, what do you do if you don't love the truth? The answer is always the same. Confess to God that you don't love the truth and ask him to give you a love of the truth, because if you don't love the truth, 
you won't be saved. You have to love the truth. And for this, and for this cause, that they did not love the truth. It's not that they didn't know the truth, or they didn't believe the truth. They did not love the truth. For this cause shall God send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Another way of putting it is that you're in denial. You really don't want the truth. And then at some point, it'll be too late for you to believe the truth. You will have believed the lie for so long, you won't be capable of hearing the truth. Delusion. An idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by rational argument. And that's the experience I had both with Alex and his stepmother. I said something to them that made sense to them. I made a rational argument. And he got upset. And her reaction was that Leviathan and her sent a bomb against me. You have to love the truth. Now that doesn't mean they can't change their mind eventually. But there was no such breakthrough with his wife. With Melissa. Tradition. Ideas that you learn from other men. Tradition is ideas that you learn from other men, teachers or parents, for example, rather than from your own understanding of the scripture that you have attained through study, prayer, and a direct communication from God by word of knowledge, word of wisdom, or revelation knowledge. Ideas learned from other men through the well-meaning do not emanate from the Spirit of God. And that's what I was trying to tell you in part one of this message or in session one of this message. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get into a dialogue w with Melissa and, and it was grieving my spirit because she was throwing scriptures at me. She was not talking to me from her own knowledge or understanding or, or passion with regard to the word. Rudiments of the world. Ideas that come from the carnal mind of the first Adam rather than from the mind of Christ. Who is the second Adam, the Lord from heaven? Rudiments of the world, ideas that come from the carnal mind of the first Adam, rather than from the mind of Christ, who is the second Adam, the Lord from heaven. Witness, I have a witness to that, witnesses to that, Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 47. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. There are two Adams and they war against each other. We are all born with the first Adam. B. Colossians 1.9 For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I ask the question, for in him, in whom, in whom? In Christ, the second man. For in, the sec in Christ, the second man, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For in Christ the second man, the Lord from heaven, dwelleth the fullness of divinity in a physical body. So she sent me in the scripture that she sent me, one of the scriptures that she sent me, it was not a King James translation, she just highlighted the word physical. So because it says that divinity dwells in a physical body, it doesn't mean that the physical body is God. The physical body is a container. There was really, there was no, there was no rational way to prove that God is all, that Jesus was all God and all man. It's simply, if you're looking at it with a rational mind, you simply can't prove it. So anybody that believes this, either they haven't looked at it, it, it they haven't looked at it uh, with their own mind and they're just repeating, parroting what's been said to them, or they're in a delusion because they're not having a rational response to the truth. God was in Christ, who was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. God was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth through Christ, 
and Christ, the second man, the Lord from heaven, was in Jesus of Nazareth. And the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth died, and Christ, the Lord from heaven, remained, because God was in Christ. And today Christ dwells in the physical bodies of the church. Let's try that again. God was in Christ, who was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. God was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth through Christ. And Christ, the second man, the Lord from heaven, was in Jesus of Nazareth. And the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth died. And Christ, the Lord from heaven, remained. And the reason he remained was that God was in Christ. And today Christ dwells in the physical bodies of the church because the physical bodies of the church are the new bodies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth died and Christ, Christ, and, Christ and God who was in Christ now are trying to acquire new bodies. They have not fully acquired new bodies yet. So if Christ is in you, you are a potential new body for Christ who was penetrated by God, or Christ who was revealing God, okay? And you won't be fully his body until he's born in you, okay? Christ, who survived the death of Jesus of Nazareth, who was revealing God, okay, God is inside of him, has to enter into your physical body and has to be born through your physical body. And the example that we give is the, the way we teach the virgin birth. That the that the Gabriel sees the womb of Mary, okay, and uh, and the second Adam was formed in her, okay, and the second Adam. I don't want to start teaching that whole thing again, but there were, the second Adam is a a, th a hybrid soul, okay. She had all of the parts of the soul of Adam that Messiah needed, and she imparted that additional soul to the fetus or to the embryo. Of the of, of called Jesus, that uh, that came into Mary's womb through impregnation by Joseph, his father. And I'm going to have to work that into these this book. I didn't work it in yet, but it has to get in there because you know if you're thinking with a rational mind, Mary has no descent from Judah. She has no descent from Judah, let alone from David and Solomon. But Joseph has descent from David on both sides of his family, on both sides he has descent from David. So the baby Jesus of Nazareth has the descent of Judah that makes him eligible to be Messiah, but his soul, his soul comes from, uh, from, um, from the, the, he receives the priesthood, the, the, pre, the Melchizedek priesthood, and, uh, and the uh, righteousness of Joseph from his mother. So Jesus himself, from that point of view, is a hybrid, if you can think of it that way. His monarchical authority, is, his kingship, comes from Judah. The authority to be a high priest and the righteousness that, that, perfected, that perfected all of him because of the righteousness that purified the whole physical body that he inherited, which in itself is sin, okay, came from Joseph. So from that point of view, he was a mixture and a hybrid, and then of course God, uh, the Holy Spirit, entered into Jesus at the time of his baptism and at the time of the marriage of Cana. A higher spirit, I'm not sure, probably the spirit of the Father uh, entered into him at the marriage, uh, from the marriage of Cana, at the time of the marriage of Cana. So God was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth through Christ, and Christ the second man, the Lord from heaven, was in Jesus of Nazareth, and the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth died, and Christ the Lord from heaven remained because God was in Christ. And today Christ dwells in the physical bodies of the church, but Christ in the physical bodies of the church is not penetrated by God yet. Christ and the physical bodies of the church was penetrated by God, okay, we would not be sick and we, and, and we would not be dying. Okay, because that is the spirit of life. 
this God is, the, he, Elohim is the Hebrew word for God, okay, and it's actually the third degree of power, which is the, the female aspect of, of the Godhead, which is, which is raising up Christ, her son, okay, that penetrates Christ and brings the spirit of life to her own son. And then when her son is inside of us, he has to be born again. And I think I didn't finish, I didn't finish my, um, I'm having, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm, I'm not speaking clearly. I, when, it, when it happens that I don't speak clearly like this, it, it doesn't happen too often, but I even study sometimes. It means I'm under a heavy spiritual attack trying to get the message out. So please just, uh, to, please just bear with me. And this has actually been going on for a couple of days with me. Maybe even the last couple of messages, I'm not sure. So what happened in, in, with Mary was that the soul, the, the righteous soul and the, and, and the authority for the priesthood entered, entered into her, okay? She received that by inheritance, okay? She received that by inheritance. The word conceive actually means to seize. So her womb was seized. The soul that she imparted to Jesus was her inheritance. She had that soul <clears throat> from her ancestors, okay, because she was a Levite, okay. And um, so she, she, <clears throat> she inherited uh, the Melchizedek, the seed of the Melchizedek priesthood from her ancestor, Phineas, and she received the righteousness of Joseph, okay, through her ancestor Phineas, whose mother was an Ephrathite because the, the seed of righteousness went to Joseph, okay, Ephraim in particular, and that came, and it was an Ephrathite woman that married uh, um, Aaron's son, um, uh, Aaron's son, okay, who was Phineas's father. Okay. So Mary inherited the righteous seed from Joseph and the seed of the Melchizedek priesthood from Phineas and, and passed that to the embryo called Jesus of Nazareth, if that's what he was called when he was born. And that embryo came into existence when Joseph, who is a descendant of David, impregnated Mary, who was a Levite and has no descent from which Messiah would spring. And this is a major argument <coughs> excuse me, that the Jews use against Christianity. These, the Jewish scholars, I've told you many times, their knowledge is incredible. <laughs> and aside from that, they're trained to, to read scripture. They would say they're trained in letters, that's what they would tell you. And they read the New Testament, and they know that Mary is a Levite, so there's no way she could bring forth Messiah, because Messiah has to descend from Judah. So unless you believe that, Joseph is the father of the, of the physical man, Jesus, you have no reason to believe that he's Messiah. It's a rational argument. It is irrational and it is a, a delusion for anyone to believe that Jesus is Messiah and that Mary brought him forth without David, without Joseph's seed. Aside from, aside from the virgin birth principle, if you're a rational person, you're delusional. If you believe that Mary brought forth Messiah, who Mary, who herself does not have any descent from David, brought forth Messiah. That in itself is irrational. That if you cannot even consider that the child was impregnated by Joseph, who is, whose descent is from Judah, you're not being rational. You have to at least consider it. And if you would just consider these things, then the truth will come to you. But if you believe that Mary was a virgin, and that Jesus, Jesus is Messiah, even though she has no descent from David whatsoever, and you're not even questioning it because that's what your pastor told you, that's what the book told you, you are delusional. And the love of the truth is not in you. And you cannot be saved if the love of the truth is not in you because the, truth, the spirit of truth is the spirit of Christ that saves you. What a mess. 
What a mess the church is in. What a mess. And they're laughing at us, brethren. They're laughing at us. The people that hate Christ, they're laughing at us. They're laughing at the church. Colossians 1.27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I think I still didn't get it out. <laughs> I still didn't get it out. So we are having a parallel experience to what Jesus had in Mary's womb, or the parallel experience to what Mary had. Okay, she had a soul that she delivered to an embryo. She was impregnated by Joseph. And there was a mixture of her soul being imparted to the embryo. And there was a birth. There was a physical birth of a third entity. Okay. What's happening to us spiritually today is that there's no third. The third entity is spiritual. But there has to be a birth. Okay. There is the soul that we inherit from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. He gives us his soul. Okay. His hybrid soul. He's delivering it to us by transmigration. Okay. And we are the body, our physical body, or at least the spiritual aspect of our physical body, okay, is likened into the embryo that was Jesus of Nazareth. There has to be a, a, a union that will produce something that never existed before. Mary's soul joined with the embryo produced Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus' hybrid soul joining with Christ Jesus in us. I think I just said the wrong thing a few minutes ago. Not our physical body. It has to join with Christ Jesus in us. Okay. Is going to produce a birth that will affect this physical body. Jesus' hybrid soul, okay, the Lord Jesus Christ joining with Christ Jesus in us, is going to interact, okay, with this body somehow and produce a spiritual birth inside of us that will change our physical body. So that, that pregnant woman in, Re in Revelation chapter 12, okay, for a while there I thought that was Jesus having the hybrid soul. No, that is the church. We have to have this birth experience. Only there's nothing, any, that which is born of the experiences will be inside of us. It will be the new man, okay? It, it, it will actually be Christ revealing God, revealing Elohim, merged with our flesh, with, with, with the Christ Jesus in the midst of us, which will affect our flesh. Hi, let me say it again. I feel like I'm not getting through to you, okay? Or maybe it's just me today. Okay. I'm still struggling, okay? Um, Christ, after Jesus of Nazareth died, Christ now exists. Christ and Elohim together. Christ, God is in Christ, okay, and he doesn't have a body. It was the body of Jesus of Nazareth died. So he's putting his, his hybrid soul into a people, and those people are called the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that there could be some, some grounds for connection. And then Christ, who's penetrated by the Lord Jesus, is going to join with the hybrid soul that he put in the people. And there is going to be, and then it's also going to blend somehow with the physical body. And there is going to be a birth of a spiritual man and, 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 and the emergence of a physical body that no longer dies. So we, our physical body is likened into the fetus in Mary's womb and the soul that Mary imparted to that to that fetus, okay, is likened into the hybrid soul that the Lord has given us. And he's giving us his hybrid soul in two parts. He starts out by giving us Christ by transmigration, and then he comes, and then the Lord Jesus, which is, re re revealed, which is revealing the Father, is coming to join with the Christ, the hybrid soul that he gave us. So there's going to be a, a union of the fullness of Christ penetrated by Elohim, but then there has to be a, an experience that joins the spiritual man with the aspects of the spiritual 
for the spiritual aspect of this body that will change the physical aspects of this body. I hope I explained it. I explain it. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult day for me. Uh, and Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. I'm just trying to identify Christ for you. God was in Christ, who was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth. God was in the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth through Christ. And Christ, the second man, the Lord from heaven, was in Jesus of Nazareth. And the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth died. And Christ, the Lord from heaven, remained because God was in Christ. And today Christ dwells in the physical bodies of the church. But not all of him, just his lower half dwells in us. His hybrid soul dwells in us. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is whole in a spiritual dimension, has to join with his feet in us. And then after he joins with his feet in us, he has to fuse with the first Adam, which is the death of the first Adam. And the first Adam, well, then the first Adam has incarnated this body. The first Adam has incarnated incarnated this body and and Satan and Leviathan are his mind and Cain is conscious mind his personality is in our blood okay so the fusion of the second Adam with the first Adam okay will be will be affecting our soul our nephesh soul our personality and our blood and our physical body everything that's not of God in those what I just named in those areas that I just named has to cease to exist. And everything that is of God will be absorbed into the second Adam. And as a result of that, I can just see it in the spirit, the second Adam swallowing up or absorbing in the first Adam. And what will come out of it is a new exterior that will be incorruptible. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have that message, Satan swallowed up. So that's exactly what's happening. The second Adam is swallowing up the first Adam. Amen. Colossians, well, what I copied down here was the scriptures of the list that Melissa gave me. And the list said Colossians 1, 21 to 28. But, but um, it's only the first two verses that, are, that we're concerned with. So I'm just going to read you the first two verses. And you that was sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So she sent me a scripture. It was not the King James where flesh was translated as physical body. So we, so we had a physical body. So God was revealed to a physical body. That doesn't mean he was holy man. How did they, how did they draw these conclusions? It's just out of a, a corrupt mind. And the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So let's take a look at the first verse. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. The first Adam influences us to think about and do wicked deeds that alienate us from God. But the second Adam, the Lord from heaven, cannot sin. 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So. I've, heard, I've been told by pastors in the church that if you're born again, if you have a born again experience, if you answer an altar call, and you have a born again experience, you cannot sin. Brethren, that is ridiculous. We're all sinners, okay? We sin every day in our mind, and that's why we get sick and age and will eventually die. The one that is born of God, of course that, that translation is unfortunate, whosoever is born of God. It's really the one who is born of God. Okay, and the one who was born of God is Adam. Uh, actually, the one who was born of God is, is Christ, actually. Adam was not born, he was formed. Christ was, 
was born. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Christ the soul, Christ the soul that was born of God, okay, does not sin. He's the son of God. Christ is the son of God. He was born of God. He cannot sin. For his seed remaineth in him. What does that mean? We're talking, that goes back to talking about the first Adam who sinned. He committed adultery with the snake. He, he didn't hold on to his seed. He gave his seed to the snake. And this world came into existence. This corrupt world came into existence prematurely. But Christ in you will hold on to his seed. He will not give it to someone else. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And I have a, this is a fragment left from verse 21. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. And that's the key word, the body of his flesh that they're saying. That means he had a flesh body, so he's holy man. The first and second atoms were reconciled with, within, inside of, the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth through a spiritual fusion that destroyed the first Adam along with his potential to influence us to sin in mind or deed. And we will have a similar experience. The two atoms are fusing. They're actually fusing now. If you've had any degree of a change of nature, if you're not doing things that you used to do, if you're a better person, if you're less of the old man and more of the new man, that's the fusion in progress. And there will be a finale to the fusion that Peter describes as the elements crashing down and everything being on fire. It's a spiritual fire. The spiritual fire is the melting of the first atom so that all of the elements that cleave to him through his adultery with the snake can be removed. And there's a scripture in Jeremiah that says the, the ovens are burning and, uh, and everything's melted, but the wicked are not plucked out. And what does that mean? It's talking about the people that have fiery trials that do not, they do not grow from those trials. They blame it on the devil, they blame it on Satan, and they never, they never see that there was sin in it. Ephesians 2.15 Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That's who he's reconciled in the body of his flesh. It happened in his flesh body. It was going to be happening, and it's happening in our flesh body, a spiritual unification of the first and second Adam. So whoever you are that's believing this doctrine, you're listening to someone that doesn't know what they're talking about and you don't understand it yourself, you're just parroting what you've been taught. Colossians 1, 22, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You know, I have to go back to what Melissa said to me. I don't want to waste your time. Just give me a couple of sentences on the scripture. I can't do that. I'm not capable of doing that. I have to show you what the scripture really says to answer you. I, I mean, what you're asking me to do, I'm not capable of doing. That was why Tuesday night I went to sleep saying, Lord, I'm not even going to answer her. You know, what, what do I say to her? You know, I say a one-sentence answer so that she can give me back another one-sentence answer. What's the point? I have to rip the whole thing apart and find out what it's really saying. That's what the Lord has done in me. Colossians 1.22, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And the glory of that spiritual fusion exists as the Christ child today. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight 
means that the glory of that spiritual fusion exists today as the Christ child in you. That's how you're unblameable. That's how you're unreprovable. It's Christ in you. And we had that scripture a couple of times recently of Jesus saying to Peter, you are whole, you are every whit whole, but not all of you. And Jesus was not referring to Judas. He was talking to Peter, you are every whit whole, you're perfect. Christ in you is perfect, but there's another side to you. That has sin. And if you don't deal with that sin, that other point of sin will corrupt the holiness that's in you. Acts 4.30 By stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus, who dwells in our heart. 1 Corinthians 1.30 but of ye of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So all of this is through the Holy Child Jesus, who dwells in our heart. Then we become filled with wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption and become rooted and grounded in love. It's only through Christ. Every good thing that we have is in Christ. We of ourselves, there's nothing about us that's good. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child, okay, this is now a new scripture that we're working on. It's the third scripture on the list. Isaiah, and this is the most difficult one, I really struggled with this. It was, I knew the answer, but it was really hard to bring it forth for some reason. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So on its surface, it sounds like Jesus is fully human, and fully God, he's the everlasting Father, he's the Prince of Peace, and he's a child that was born. So that's when you take the scripture on the surface like this and draw a carnal conclusion. So let's, let's rip this apart. For unto us a child is born. Strong's 3206 is translated child. Born is trans 3205. It's interesting, those words are very similar. A child is something born, it means an offspring, and that which is born, it means to bear young, so there's a physical body there. Jesus of Nazareth is the human child that was born to Mary. Witness, Luke 1, 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and we now know that word conceive merely means your womb was, her womb was seized. Okay, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So her womb was seized and she brought forth a son, so there was something special about, about what happened to her because her womb was seized. And what happened was that the soul of the, of the first, of the soul of the second Adam uh, entered in. You shall bring forth a human son named Jesus. So the question is, what, why was her soul Seized. Well, the church will tell you because she was a, she brought forth a child without a man, but we know that's not true. So why was her soul seized? Seized, the soul of the second Adam entered in. It was a Gilgo. Jesus was a Gilgo. The unto us a son is given. The word son is. And this is important because there were, in these, in these scriptures as we go through them, there are two different words translated son. So this particular word is Strong's 1121, and it doesn't mean a, a particular person, it means a son as a builder of the family name. So we're getting back to the, found, the, the founder of the family. The idea is not of a particular person, but of the beginning of a new line. That's the general idea. And the word giving, Strong's 5414, means to give. 
So the son that was given, now this son was not born, this son was given. The word son, that Strong's 1121, the founder of the family name, was given. He wasn't born. Okay, that means he was a spiritual foundation. The son that was given, not born, is that holy thing. That is the foundation stone of the spiritual building of God. God is building a spiritual building. Because his family, the family of God, are building. We are, each one of us is a, a brick or a stone or a mansion, okay, that makes up a, a, a collective building that God dwells in. So the sun that was given is that holy thing that is the foundation of the building. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay, a Zion, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We have a house underneath this physical body. And that spiritual house is Christ in you. Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth up into a holy temple in the Lord. So we see that our physical bodies are the building, and our soul inside of us, the Christ inside of us, is the temple. Okay. There's no temple being built over in the Middle East that's of God. So the sun that was given is that holy thing which is the foundation of the spiritual building that God is building. That was born with the child Jesus. The son that was given, not born, is that holy thing that is the foundation stone of the spiritual building of God that was born with the child called Jesus. There was a child born that was Jesus and there was a son born which is the founder of the family line which was Christ. Luke 1 35. So that was righteous Adam that, that was imparted to the womb of Mary that was seized. Okay. Luke 1 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The child is called Jesus, and the holy thing is called the Son of God. The Son of God was inside of the man Jesus. So Jesus was called the Son of God. The Son of God is inside of me, so you can call me a Son of God. If the Son of God is inside of you, you can be called a Son of God. We are the sons of God because the Son of God is inside of us. So the child is called Jesus, and the holy thing is called the Son of God. Matthew 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus was called the Christ, the Son of the living God, because Christ, the Son of the living God, was inside of him. And in all fairness, this is really confusing to people. It just proves that you cannot understand the scripture without a teacher. And you better make sure that you get the right teacher because there are a lot of false teachers out there. But you cannot understand spiritual things without a teacher. You really can't. Maybe after years of studying with a teacher you can function on your own. But you need to be trained on how to, how to rightly divide the word of truth. You have to be trained as to, as to how to think about what you're reading. And that's, that's one of the, and the Lord just taught us this, this year, I think it's just fascinating to say that every part of Jesus is called Jesus. He's the name of God, he's the son, Jesus is the name of God, Jesus is the son of God, Jesus is the son of man. He has the same name, all parts of him have the same name. 
my, my nefesh is Sheila, my neshama is Sheila, my ruach is Sheila, it's all the same name. And that can be very confusing to somebody that doesn't understand that. So the Son of God, which is Christ, was inside of the child Jesus, and God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. The Son of David, this is not really a part of the scripture, but I put it in there because it, it just seemed to belong there. Matthew 22, verses 42 to 45 saying, what think, this is, this is Jesus challenging the Pharisees, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. So the Pharisees knew that Christ is the son of David, that he had to descend from David, from the tribe of Judah and from David, which Mary does not. Well, you church people, you're in a delusion. This is logical. It's in the scripture. You can read it for yourself. You're denying logic. Faith does not deny logic. Faith might deny natural laws. Faith might open, split the Red Sea, violating the natural law of this world. That means a higher power came in and overshadowed the power that sustains this world. But that's not logic. Okay? When you look at the book that is, that is your foundation, the book that your, is your authority, and it says that Messiah has to come from the tribe of Judah, and Jesus doesn't come from the tribe of Judah if Mary is his only parent. That's not faith. That's denying rational thought. They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, as it says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So what, they, what Jesus is saying is that what that psalm means is that David called Messiah Lord. The Lord said, the Lord said to my Lord. The Lord said to Christ, okay. The Lord said to Christ, Sit thou at my right hand. So if David then called him Lord, how? Because David wrote the psalm. David wrote the psalm, okay, saying, Jehovah said to Messiah. David is saying, this, this scripture is saying, Jehovah, David's writing the psalm and he's saying, Jehovah said to Messiah, calling Messiah Lord, knowing that Messiah is supposed to be the son of David. How could, how could David, when writing the psalm, say, that Jehovah calls Messiah Lord, or calls Messiah God, when everybody knows that Messiah is the son of David. How can that be? Did I make that clear? If David then called him Lord, how is he David's son? So I reiterated here. If David called Christ Lord, how can Christ be a human son? That's the question. How can Christ the image of God, be a man? That's the question. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Christ is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. How can he be a man? How can the image of God be a man? The answer is that one was inside of the other. Not that they're both God, one was inside of the other. The invisible Christ, the image of God, was inside of the man Jesus of Nazareth, and God was inside of Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus is the name of God. Christ survived the death of Jesus of Nazareth because God was inside of him. The personality or the soul the personality is the soul of Jesus of Nazareth, survived also. Christ survived the death of Jesus of Nazareth because God was inside of him. The personality or the soul of Jesus of Nazareth survived also 
because it was cleaving to Christ. Our personality will survive the death of this body if we are cleaving unto Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God inside of Christ, the image of God, covered by the personality or the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. The Lord Jesus Christ is God inside of Christ, who is the image of God, covered by the personality or the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. The body of Jesus of Nazareth died, but his soul survived. His nephesh survived. Jesus is the name of God. Jesus Christ, Jesus is Christ, the image of God, covered by the personality or the soul of Jesus, the spiritual garment or the soul that covers and reveals God. Jesus is not God. Jesus is Christ, the image of God, covered by the personality or the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, only his soul survived. And Jesus of Nazareth, the soul of Jesus of Nazareth being a spiritual garment, a soul that covers and reveals God. I should say it covers Christ. I should say it covers Christ and reveals God. Jesus is not God. Jesus is Adam. He is a spiritual man. He is righteous Adam. He is the Son of God. Adam is the Son of God. The ministry of Jesus. Luke 1, 32 and 33. He shall be great. This is a prophecy. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Starting with Luke 1, 32. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. I'm reiterating now. The Lord Jesus Christ shall be great, and Christ shall be called the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give the throne of David his father to the personality or the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. So we see three different aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned in this scripture. The Lord Jesus shall be great. Christ within him shall be called the Son of God. And the personality of the nephesh of Jesus of Nazareth that was saved shall inherit the throne of David his father. This is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the name of God. This is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the revelation of God through Christ, the image of God, revealed through the personality of Jesus of Nazareth. It is not the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Luke 132 is not the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. It is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall be great. Christ, which is a part of him, shall be, be the Son of God. And his personality, the personality of Jesus, okay, shall receive the throne of his father David. So his personality had to be saved because his personality inherits the throne. That's the whole point, that Messiah has to be a descendant of Judah. And Mary is a, is a Levite. His descent from Judah comes from Joseph. Luke 133. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jehovah never changes. All of you Christians that say he's different in the New Testament, you're confused and you're deluded. He's the same righteous God. His methods may change. The way he relates to us is different. But he never changes, and his morality never changes. So he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And I found that really interesting. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. I think I wrote that down here. The house of Jacob, brethren, are the 12 tribes of national Israel. That's a physical 
That's talking about physical descent. And we don't know where those tribes are. And the truth of the matter is the Jews that call themselves Jews today are converts. Okay? They're Japhethites. They're, they're Europeans. They're non-Semitic people. I do not believe that this prophecy includes converts. The house of Jacob does not... Well, there might be some converts in it, but you can't, you can't say it's just the Jews that are Jews today. You can't say that the whole... that this prophecy is all for the Polish and Russian Jews that are Jewish today. Yeah, you, it has to be the strangers in the land are, are few. Where are the 12 tribes? Where are the, where are the indigenous tribes? The house of Jacob are the 12 tribes of national Israel. I do not believe that this prophecy includes converts, or maybe I'm changing my mind. Maybe it could include... I don't know if it includes converts. It doesn't say... Well, I don't know. But even if it does include converts, it can't be all converts. So please note that Jacob is a Semite. He is Semitic. That is, he is brown-skinned. He is brown-skinned. Comes from the Middle East. Where are you? So... Christ is going to rule over the house of Jacob forever. Where, where is Jacob? There's a lot that hasn't happened yet, brethren. Only a remnant seed return for this prophecy. Only a remnant need return for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And that's a, that's a mystery. It doesn't have to be every single person that's in, in a descendant of, of Jacob. There just has to be a handful of Jacobians for this, to, for this prophecy to be fulfilled. But basically what it's saying is that this spiritual man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a man, he's a spiritual man, will rule over the natural descendants of Jacob forever. So there has to, what it means is that there has to be some natural descendants of Jacob for Christ to rule over for this prophecy to come to pass. And it can't be all converts. It can't be all the people who call themselves Jews. So it's Christians, okay. So, so they're lost, they're mixed in with Christianity somewhere. But somehow I would think that there has to be some event that will show that this is satisfied, unless you just believe the church satisfies it, that the, that the Semitic people that are Christians um, are the fulfillment. But, but there's no way to really know that they're the house of Jacob. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, is there going to be a revelation? Is there going to be, once Christ stands up, okay, and the Son of Man is in full power in the earth, is he going to reveal who the house of Jacob are, who the natural descendants of Jacob are. And it's a possibility that he's going to do that. And of course that's in addition to the prophecy of, of the church. Christ, he's the head of the church. If Christ is in you, you're a part of, you're a part of the church, you're a part of the body. But in addition to that, he's going to rule over the house of Jacob forever. Now that doesn't mean Christ will be in the house of Jacob means he will rule over the house of Jacob. So I don't think that makes the Jews very happy, but that's what the scripture says. There will be a company of people, okay, that will be representing that, the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual deity will be revealed through them. There will be the high priest. They will have the Melchizedek priesthood. They will have righteousness. They will be spiritual descendants of, the, of David, and they will rule over the natural people who are the descendants of Jacob. Now, brother, this is very interesting, and I think about it a lot. I remember years ago, I was doing a study in the book of Revelation, and I saw it. I saw that in the last days, that when the, when the prophecy of the book of Revelation was, was complete, that there were going to be layers of people. It was, there was going to be um, layers of, of society. Everybody is not going to be equal in the kingdom. 
And I looked at it and I was surprised that there were going to be, a, there was going to be, a, for example, a physical body that those that were in Christ would be higher than. I thought everybody would be equalized in the kingdom, but I, it doesn't look that way. Everybody, it looks like, according to what I read, that everybody will not be in the same place. There will be those that are in the priesthood. They will have. They will be manifestations of the Son of Man. Okay, and then there will be those who will benefit from their rule. It will be a righteous rule, and there will be those who will benefit from that rule, but they will not have Christ. And that's sort of reflected in Gilgamesh. There were things in Gilgamesh that I didn't understand when I preached it. I wondered who the citizens of his country were. And that seems to be the, the plan. Just in, like in Solomon's day, he ruled over nations that were tributaries to him. But it will be a righteous rule, although everybody will not be manifestations of Christ. But they will live in peace and happiness. That's, that's the way it looks to me right now. And that's a radical thing to say in, this, in, this, in the Western world today, which is trying to make everybody equal. But I know right now everybody's not equal. Everybody's not the same. Everybody's not the same in the church. Everybody's not the same in their humanity. Everybody's not the same. We have different degrees of strength, different degrees of intelligence, different degrees of ability. What God has promised, what he has promised is what is the right word I want to use? What he has promised is, um, why can't I think of the word I want to use? He's, he's promised a working society where everybody will be taken care of, but everybody will not be the same, but no one will cross over and conflict with someone else. And of course, that's what the believers in Utopia have tried to bring to pass. That's what communism prophesies, utopia, where everybody is cared for. Everybody may not be the same, but they're perfectly cared for and happy with their place so no one tries to cross over into someone else's place. I, I read today in the news that someone was elected to the, I believe it was a Colorado council. On the, on the, and they, they were campaigning on the, on the policy of communism must be implemented at no matter what it takes. And he, preaching that, he was elected to the Colorado Council. He's actually preaching the violent overthrow of the government, and he's not arrested. First Chronicles 29, 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And I gave you that witness to the scripture that says, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, there shall be no end. Oh, it's late. I guess I better stop here. I thought I would finish this scripture, but it's already three o'clock. I better let you go home. I better let you go home. Um, I don't know if we'll pick up on this on Sunday. I honestly don't know. I don't know what the Lord's going to have me do. It was just the last two days were insane. And I'm going to try to, uh, to write up the rest of the scriptures and turn it over to Susan to make a book out of it. And we'll see what God gives us on Sunday. I don't know, but I'm sure that it will be something that will be edifying. Are there any questions, Susan? Don't think so. Okay. God bless you all.